as it goes. All right. So welcome to All Things Aviation, the final episode for 2020. What a heck of a year we have had. And our focus today is on expanding the diversity envelope in aviation and aerospace. Have some really great guests on today and uh, we've been having some technical issues. So this is gonna kind of just go with the flow. Um, but, you know, all of us uh, in, in the technical world, whether it's as a pilot or whatever, we, we're used to uh, making the adjustment on the fly, so to speak. Uh, our, our, I'll start out with introducing our guest. Her first guest who just joined us coming out of a meeting is Lieutenant Commander LaShonda Holmes. Uh, Lieutenant Commander Holmes is currently a U.S. Uh, Coast Guard Senate liaison. Prior to that, uh, she was a Lieutenant, um, she was a MH-65 Dolphin helicopter pilot for, uh, at the Coast Guard station in Miami, Florida. Uh, which happens to be one of the Coast Guard's busiest air stations in the country. Uh, we also have Carl Conliffe. Well, let me back up and just say welcome, Lieutenant Commander. Great to have Thank you. Thank you. I'm show. glad to be here. Thank glad you. Glad to have you here. We also have Carl Conliffe. Carl and I go way back a couple of decades, but Carl is currently the project manager for the Eagle 3 Common Satellite Testbed product line. Say that five times real fast. Uh, at Northrop Grumman Space Systems in Redondo Beach, California. You guys got some good sun out there? While we're shoveling it's snow. It's overcast oh. today. Oh, it's overcast? Yeah. Oh, darn. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, um, uh, in, in his role, he managed, Carl manages multi -dis a multidiscipline team of engineers that builds test beds for multi multiple satellite programs. It's so much that he does, I can't even you know, get it out of my mouth good. Uh, Carl, welcome back to the program. It's great to have you on as a guest. Thank you. And then we have uh, Steve Black, who I think is still, Steve, are you there? Cause I'm looking at a uh, different screen. I think so, can you hear me? Oh, there we go. We so can we hear you, Steve. awesome. We can hear you and you can hear us. Wow, this is wonderful, technology. <laughs> Steve is a retired command chief, uh, warrant officer, <laughs> command chief U.S. Army warrant officer uh, who's, who used to fly Bell H-1 Huey helicopters and the uh, Sikorsky UH-6 Blackhawks. Everybody knows the movie Black Hawk Down. Hopefully that wasn't one of uh, one that Steve had to deal with. Steve also has flown offshore and medevac missions in the what's now called the Leonardo, used to be called the Augusta Westland AW-139 helicopter and the Sikorsky S-76 helicopter. Steve, welcome. Thank you. <laughs> Tech definitely. Great to have you. Great to have you with us. Uh, technical <laughs> stuff and all. Uh, and then we have, and this, this is where I always get tripped up because I always have a guest who has a name that challenges me, but I'm going to try to get this one right. So this is Diudani Kazumbe. Did I get that right? Correct. Okay, not bad. Um, but we can call him Dio. Thank you, Dio, for letting us do that. <laughs> He's a graduate of Washington, D.C.'s Trans-STEM Academy at the Francis Cardozo Education Campus in D.C. Uh, he was an active participant in aviation field trips and, and brown bag luncheons uh, and is on uh, two scholarships from the Aero Club Foundation of Washington. Deal now is a sophomore at Arizona, Arizona State University. Um, he's always dreamed of becoming a professional pilot. He's in their flight training program, and he's also studying uh, aviation management. And we will hear more about Dio's background, which is a very interesting one. Uh, Dio, welcome to the show. Thank you. Great to have you here. The other aspiring young aviation professional we have is Nico Jackson. Uh, Nico is an 11th grader. He's also in the junior ROTC program for the Air Force uh, at his high school. And he uh, literally flies a flight simulator every day um, and has logged all of his flights. He has accumulated, get this, 3, 000, over 3,650 hours of simulator time. <laughs> so, so I think he's kind of serious about flying. I don't know. You know? <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> Welcome, Nico, to the show. Nico, Scott, so Nico, I'm going to start out with you because you have an interesting story to tell. Um, so you're with you're a student member of the uh, East Coast chapter of the Tuskegee Airmen. You've yes, had the privilege of meeting uh, Brigadier General uh, Charles McGee. 
and and his daughter who runs the f uh, flight training program there you guys did a uh, um some flying a week or two ago i think a couple of weeks ago yes, like a couple sir. saturdays ago and i heard that you just went over to a pilot that was in a kind of a cool aircraft <laughs> and and said uh and they offered for you to go up flying tell us about that what kind of airplane was it and, and what happened with that well, it was a uh, Stearman, I believe, a ST-17. It was a, a Stearman uh, model right. aircraft. The same type um, of aircraft that the general trained in 70 years ago. Yep. Yes, sir. And, um, yeah, so when we first pulled up to the parking lot, it's actually funny. I saw her pulling the, um, pulling the plane out of the hangar. I was just like, man, I had my camera with me. So I was just like, man, I really want to take some pictures of that. So. We go down there, we um, sign in, you know, we had to sign in so we can um, fly. And while we were sitting out there on the um, on the ground, uh, she pulled the plane around so it could uh, so she could get some fuel so she could fly it, you know, for a little bit, get some um, hours on it. And I asked her, you know, uh, first, what we talked about the plane, I asked her, you know, the history of it and where it came from. Um, and just before she was about to go flying, I asked if I could, you know, tag along with you before, you know, I had to um, go fly myself. And she was just like, sure. So it was, it was really, 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 really. Open exciting. cockpit. It doesn't get any better than that. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That, that had to be a thrill for you. Well, I'm glad you had to, you got that experience and it probably was kind of even more of, of a unique experience considering that that was an, a same type of aircraft that the general had trained in. And all the Indeed. Tuskegee Airmen, actually. Yes, sir, it was. Yeah. Yeah. So what are you looking forward to today, Nico, being on the show? You know, we kind of grabbed you only a few days ago to see if you were available. And now here you are and you're getting ready to talk to some seasoned aviation and aerospace professionals. Well, I hope to, first off, gain the, you know, the, the knowledge and the information you guys have to offer. Because, I mean, you guys are where exactly where I'd like to be. So... <laughs> I'd really like to gain that information and be able to network and, you know, essentially just work out everything that I need to work out to become a pilot or, you know, see what I need to do and just keep, keep going at it and reach my goal. Honestly, I'm just really excited to be here to talk to you guys. You guys well, we're so very excited to have you here and we're going to share a lot of uh, information and you can, you're going to have the opportunity to speak directly with everybody, ask questions and things like that. Let me go ahead and, and go back to Dio. Dio, tell us a little bit about you. You're, you, you're, uh, uh, I've said earlier that your situation is unique. You're actually a refugee from Uganda. Um, and you came here how long ago now? Six years? Six years. Yes. Okay. So tell us a little bit about that and, and about you getting into flying into aviation. So uh, I was born in uh, Democratic Republic of Congo, which is like at the very center of uh, uh, African continent. Can you hear me well? Yes, we can. So yeah, uh, this was April 20, 2001. And I lost my parents at a very early age. I was about three, four years old. And I had to move in with, with my grandma. Um, and so a few years later, uh, this was around 2006, uh, there was a lot of civil war going and I was, uh, my family was part of the people uh, largely uh, affected, but luckily enough, we were able to move to Uganda, which was uh, so close to where we lived because uh, the city where we grew, uh, I grew up from, Goma, the, the, at an early age, uh, it, it's only a few miles away from Uganda. So we were able to uh, actually walk to Uganda and we were there from when I was six, six five or six to uh, until 2014, when we were able to come here to the so U.S. So, how did you how did you become interested in in aviation? It's it's a very interesting story, and I usually say that ride, me going from Uganda to here, was actually uh, a turning point where I looked uh, I looked at myself, and uh, I always ask myself this question for uh, from when I was a kid: is what's next? Uh, what now? And uh, what happens after this? And I looked at myself, I was thinking, I was like, what, what do I want to be in the future? Like, what, what goals do I have set for myself? Because one thing I'm always afraid of is not knowing where I am or where I'm, where I'm, where I'm heading, uh, whether physically or mentally. And uh, I was looking at the, the pilot. Um, the uh, pilot came in from the cockpit uh, down the aisle 
And a few minutes later, he went back and I was like, that's a cool uniform. I, I, I would want to do something like that. <laughs> and just before takeoff, I was like, yep, this is it. I mean, I don't think there's anything else. And uh, from that point, I told myself that if someone ever asked me, uh, what do you want to be in the future? I'll tell them I want to be a pilot. And that was the drive of everything I have been able to do in the last six years was based on that statement. I want to be a pilot and I'm going to do whatever it takes to be, to get there and look where I am. Well, there you go. Yeah. We'll talk some more about your background in a little bit. I want to share with you guys uh, some of the background of the three professional guests that we have on. We'll start with Lieutenant Commander Holmes. Lieutenant Commander Holmes, you have had one <laughs> heck of a career already and you seem to just be warming up. <laughs> well, can you hear me all right yes. as well? Okay. Well, I, I sure hope I'm just warming up. Uh, and uh, it has been a, a really cool ride this year. Mm. I just hit the 15-year the mark in, in the Coast Guard, United States Coast Guard. And I, it, I, it's really been, really been a blessing. Yeah. Um, I could, Tell I us could how you got started. How did you get into flying? How did you end up flying Coast Guard helicopters? When, when, when did you get interested in flying and how did that all come about? It was, it was when I met uh, another black female pilot who flew for the Coast Guard. So I joined the Coast Guard through a C-SPY, or I'm sorry, through an ROTC type program called C-SPY. Uh, that CSPI stands for College Student Pre-Commissioning Initiative. It's a scholarship program. You're a full-time enlisted member of the Coast Guard when you join. You're getting paid you know, on the 1st and the 15th, you've got the medical and you're going to school for, for your last two years. And then you get guaranteed officer candidate school right after that. So wow. I, I attended Spelman College in Atlanta, Georgia. It's an all women's school. And I graduated in May of 2007. I had already been in the Coast Guard two years. And I what wasn't- What did you study? I'm sorry, psychology. what did you study? Psychology. Psychology, okay. Uh-huh. That and, might come uh, in because handy. Because <laughs> I, I aged out of the, the foster care program. So at that point in, in my life, I was thinking I wanted to um, be a therapist or a counselor in, mm. in my own group home. So that was the reason for that. Okay. And so I graduated in May, but I wasn't due to go to officer candidate school into the next January of 08. So I had some, some time to do some Coast Guard related activities. And I was underway on one of our ships sailing from Seattle to Japan. And it was really neat. I thought I wanted to be a ship driver. And while I was underway, the operations officer said, hey, you know, do you know what you want to do? I said, yeah, driving a ship. This is so cool. And he said, well, have you ever thought about flying? And I said, well, you know, don't you have to be really smart to do that or an engineer or go to the Air Force Academy? And they said, no, we've seen you doing hard work here on the boat. Um, you should look into it because right now the Coast Guard only has one black female pilot. And that wow. was, in, you know, towards the end of 2007, coming from Spelman College, a historically black college full of women, you know, I was just floored by this. So I looked her up. Her name is was Janine Minzie. She was stationed in Clearwater, Florida, flying C-130s at the time. So I sent her an email that night and I said, I heard you were the only black pilot and, you know, female pilot in the Coast Guard. Is this true? This is incredible. Can I meet you? And she said, well, if you can get the Coast Guard to, you know, give you orders once you pull in from the boat from Seattle uh, to Clearwater, I'll show you the ropes. And, uh, and literally at wow. that point in my life, I had never formally met a pilot. I'd never met one I'd never thought about flying so the first pilot that I you know really meet is this black woman from Jamaica she had been flying before she joined the Coast Guard she was a flight instructor before the Coast Guard and she took me up on my first flight and and ever since then I just knew from meeting her and seeing her that I could at least give it a shot and that's what I did and I went to officer candidate school and right after that I went straight to to flight school at um, Naval Air Station Pensacola. They teach us how to fly airplanes first, first blue right. and T-34 turbo mentor. Right now they're flying the T-6. And then I also learned how to fly helicopters while I was there. So this is, this is what we want the, the, the young people that are watching, including the two that are on the program to hear. There's so many different paths that you guys take to get to where you are, that we all take, uh, all of us that are professionals in the industry. and. You had never even thought about flying, had never actually been in, in a helicopter before. No, and, never. And, and so what was that like when you first got to Pensacola and started flight training? And, and how did that transition to you um, finally, you know, being able to fly a helicopter? And then apparently you're very good at it. 
Well, <laughs> well, it's terrifying, right? It, it's exciting and it's terrifying at the same time. When you first get to flight school, um, you do introductory flight training, basically, where they want to make sure uh, you won't crash, you don't get airsick, and you kind of get the basics of flying. So you're flying in a Cessna or a small single engine airplane. So not about- crashing is a requirement. <laughs> no, no. I mean, I, I nearly did. I nearly did. I've got to tell you. But um, so you get about 10 hours of, of ex- time with uh, an instructor and then you have to go out and do a solo. And so I remember and this is this is one of the terrifying moments because flying with the instructor, I was doing totally fine. I was icing my landings. Everything was smooth. And then I get there on my solo and you have to fly at least 50 nautical miles out and I get to an airport I see a bunch of guys who own their own planes kind of on the side of the runway. And I'm just saying, you know, uh, aim point, airspeed, flaps, you know, just go through everything in my mind. And everything is looking good. Um, I've got the runway alignment. But then I just hit the nose wheel so hard. And then I porpoise like this all oh the way gosh. down the runway. And it was so violent. Oh, my goodness. I, I taxied off of the active. And I had to get out. I just knew I broke something or it wouldn't fly again. So I got I shut it down. I had to like pull off, you know, I was was panicking (laughs) and I'm looking under the plane, looking all over, like I had to break something. And then the guys um, that had seen me, they came over and they seemed so surprised, you know, like where did this, you know, young black girl come from in this plane? And she almost killed herself. (laughs) Anyway, so I just, I had to tell myself, Hey, just shake it off. It's fine. It happens. It's your first corpus, but you know, and then I, I, started the plane back up. I got back in the pattern and I did a couple more good ones. And there you go. So anyway, and, and I, the and rest I kept, was history, right? And the rest was history. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's funny. You say that we'll come back about talking about a few more things in terms of your background, but the, the soloing, the, the, the quick thing I'll tell you guys, I soloed at nine hours. And when the instructor stepped out of, I was in a Cessna 150, a little two seater. And when the instructor stepped out of the plane, and had a handheld and he was like, okay, go fly, have a good time. (laughs) As I was taxiing, my right leg started shaking uncontrollably. I mean, it was (laughs) like, I was like, I'm gonna, I'm not even gonna make it down to the end of the runway to take off, uh, the end of the taxiway to take off on the runway because my leg was shaking. And then all of a sudden I pulled on center line and was clear to take off. And then my whole body just um, like a Zen moment, just calmed down. And then I did what I had to do. But I think we all can tell a story about our first solo or, you know, something r- related to it and that type of thing. Very cool uh, to, to hear that from you. Uh, Steve Black. Steve, yes, you've been flying helicopters for a long time. Um, yes, you started out flying them in the Army. But, but how did that all, how did that come about um, for you to, to actually become a pilot, helicopter pilot? Uh, my initial... Uh reason for wanting to fly was my aunt taking me to the airport when I was a young kid and me seeing the planes uh, and they were huge. You see them in the sky and they're tiny. And so I'm holding my aunt's hand and she asks if you want to be a pilot. So of course I did at that time. And uh, <laughs> uh, and it's history since then. I've, my buddy and I would go to the airport when we were younger, got a, a license, 16 years old to drive. And at that time you could get closer to the runway, the airport, and you just watch the planes come in. So we're kind of nerds in that sense. We had a Bell 222 uh, that'd fly around the neighborhood and, uh, you know, we'd always gawk at that thing. So that was the start. And then, uh, you know, in high school, 11th grade, a recruiter showed up and said something about a warrant officer flight training. And I I said, could I do it? He said, yes. So uh, I made the application, uh, was qualified, non-select, and that was due to my uh, academics, and I did not apply myself like I should have in high school. So I had the aptitude, but uh, at that time, I just didn't know where I wanted to. Didn't know what I wanted to do. Uh, anyway, the recruiter told me that most pilots uh, actually come in from within the military. So uh, I joined as a crew chief. I was a Chinook crew chief for uh, six and a half years, crew chief and a flight engineer. Uh, finally got accepted to flight school <clears throat> and uh, 93 and there at Fleet Bees and Blackhawks and then uh, had a career of flying, uh, flying in the military. What was that like? What was that like to be a crew chief for that period of time when you knew what you really wanted to do was be up in the cockpit? 
what was, how did you, how did you deal with that? Um, you know, what's your perspective on that? Sure. I was enamored with aviation. So although I was maintaining an aircraft, I was also a part of the crew. So I was flying. So, I, you know, if I had to go back and do it again, I would do the same thing, but I would apply myself academically in high school. Uh, but I wouldn't change that for anything. I wouldn't take those crew chief years away for anything because it taught me so much. It right. actually made, made flight school substantially easier than it would have if I hadn't done that. So. Well, and because you knew what it was like to be in the back and maintaining an aircraft, et cetera, and so forth, as a pilot, you can appreciate what the crews do. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, well, and 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 so uh, was there much of a transition for you from how many years did you fly in the army before you uh, transitioned to civilian? Uh, about eighteen years. Okay. So was there much of a transition to fly civilian? Um, yes, it was. Uh, <laughs> I think the military has a little bit more money to to pay for your school, whereas what I found on the civil side is uh, you know time is money. And uh, we want to get you to where we want to go. But I didn't feel, you know, as thoroughly trained as I did in the military. <laughs> so I had to kind of do a little OJT. And I got comfortable flying offshore and doing that fairly quickly. That wasn't such a big deal. But, uh, you know, I expected, you know, CRM uh, on the civil side. We talk about it a lot. But I, I expected a little more at that time. And maybe in helicopters, it's not as defined as it is in the fixed wing side. I mean, we you know, the rotary wing side kind of falls behind uh, the fixed wing side. So uh, there's a few things I had to get used to. Uh, I was a tactical pilot <laughs> and uh, there they don't fly tactics. So we, in the simulator, we had to do a confined area approach. Well, there's only one way I know how to do it and that's low level and then the trees. Well, I made a turn before 300 feet and uh, another instructor uh, was training in the S-76 and he sat there and yelled at me. <laughs> You know, like, you know, you can yell at me if you want to. I don't know. These are new conditions for me. So just tell me and I can generally get it. Got you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that, is, that is an adjustment to make. I want to give the uh, aspiring young aviation professionals a chance to ask some questions. But before I do that, let me talk to Carl for a second. Carl, uh, you've also had a unique path. Um, you actually weren't even thinking about aerospace in the, the early days. So, uh, but you, you have an engineering mind. So tell us about you and and how you got into engineering and how that translated to what you do now. Yeah, my name is uh, Carl Conliffe. I'm actually an electrical engineer manager now at um, in North of Grumman. I actually got, um, when I was pretty young, I had an uncle that was an um, electrical engineer. He was the coolest guy, you know, had a really nice car and was just real cool and down to earth. And I, in my mind, that's how all engineers were. I mean, there, was, there wasn't the concept of being a nerd as an engineer, right? So I decided pretty young that I wanted to be an engineer and he could actually fix all kinds of things. Every time I had some sort of electronic toy that would break, my uncle could fix it for us and so forth. And so that's what really got me the interest. And then as I kind of you know, went into school and such, got a, uh, very interested in math and science, was really good in math and science, um, and so it was obviously kind of the natural path for me to go into um, engineering. And then I chose electrical engineering because that was what I had the most um, interest in. So I um, got my first job in the field of um, electronics when I was in high school or just after high school, I actually worked at a, doing electronics assembly. So kind of started out at kind of the lowest tier of um, the electrical engineering field. Um, from there, went on to become a technician when I was in junior college, you know, managed an electronics lab, um, taught some classes on the side as well, um, and then went to San Diego State where I got my um, electrical engineering degree. Um, and at that point, I was really, um, unlike you, I, you guys, I, I liked aviation, but I you know, thought, yeah, maybe one day I'll try and be a pilot as a hobby and stuff. Um, and I have a story as to why I didn't choose aviation and Vince is an integral part of that. So maybe I'll tell you guys later if- Oh shoot, what time. I do? No, I'm just <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but ended up, um, you know, uh, through some friends and contacts I had made as a result of being, um, when I was in college, I was actually the chairman of the National Society of Black Engineers. And um, because that made numerous contacts and actually had some friends that were working at TRW at the time in Los Angeles and submitted a resume to them and, you know, got kind of called up to uh, go work there, um, which is really kind of a, a change in career. And that was actually an aerospace company 
But up until that point, when I got that job, I wanted to be in the automotive industry, work in electronics for a, you know, some sort of race team. Um, and because all the companies that did that were in the Midwest where it was freezing cold, um, I decided not to do that, you know, being kind of, you know, growing up in high school in, in San Diego. And so um, ended up, you know, pretty much for weather purposes, you know, going to work at TRW and 25 years later, I'm still there. Um, you know, now we're north of Grumman, of course, but that was pretty much um, my path as to going there. But I think one thing that, um, and I, I uh, you know, Lieutenant, uh, Lieutenant Commander Holmes, I mean, her story kind of resonates with me is, you know, because I saw somebody that I was able to look up to that was doing what I wanted to do one day, exactly. just like she saw the uh, pilot um, with the Coast Guard. Uh, because if you, if you see somebody doing what you do, you can more visualize it. And that was actually what um, kind of helped me pave my way to going into it as well. Sure. And that's one of the things that, uh, you know, we're trying to do with the program today. Uh, as an example, giving these two young men that are here today an opportunity to interact with professionals like you guys who have been uh, um, part of this um, and have been in the industry as professionals for a long time. And it's, you know, it's not always that these, I want to call them kids, <laughs> but these young, young folks have had that opportunity. So speaking of that, uh, I'm going to turn it to you, Dio, and to you, Nico, either one of you guys. I'm sure you guys have some questions you'd like to ask our guests. Yeah, Indeed. I do. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, no, I was just going to, um, I was just going to ask. So when, what, what did you guys know what exactly you wanted to major in when you guys were going through college and what would be the best things to major in to get to, you know, where you guys were, you know, being a pilot or having that as a career? That is a really great question because there's a lot of answers to it. Go ahead, guys. And anybody? Um... I guess I'll, I can start. Um... Like it, my, my first two years at Spelman, I was a biochemistry major and then I changed it and, and ended up graduating with a degree in psychology and my master's is in management. So really, I think it just comes down to just pure will and performance. If you, if you wanna be a pilot, of course you could be a, you know, do something in aeronautics or science, physics, things like that. But if that isn't your, your uh, major or your educational background, that doesn't mean that those opportunities are off the table for you. Yeah, I think that's really great to point that out because I, I had some female pilot guests, military pilot guests on several shows ago. One of them was a history major. One of them was a molecular biology major. And one of them was an English lit major. Uh, but they're all, um, you know, flying these great missions in, in the various branches of the service. Um, did Steve, did you or um, Carl, you guys want to chime in on, on that question? I'll just sure, say, sure. Uh, Go ahead, Carl. Go, Steve. Go ahead, Steve. Uh, yeah, again, I'll just say, I'll pick it back off the Lieutenant Commander uh, <laughs> military term. Uh, as far as the specific degree in aviation, I don't believe that that's that's a big, most job, uh, most job uh, applications, you, you don't see so much college, a specific college education. They'll just say a bachelor's degree, and that's not even a requirement. Uh, they set that aside for experience. So if you have uh, a set amount of experience, they'll bypass the college education. Uh, <clears throat> so I'd say don't let that be a hindrance, no matter what degree you get, uh, you know, unless you get a specific degree flying. Uh, in my opinion, I think it's, I don't think it's as important as people place it to be. I think if you go that route, that, that doesn't hurt, certainly doesn't. But if you're not, uh, I don't think that's a hindrance in my opinion. Yeah. Carl, you have some things about that. Yeah, I mean, it's a little different for, for my career uh, because um, definitely as an engineer, the guy that's sort of designing aspects of a plane or designing aspects of a satellite spacecraft and such, um, you do need the specific technical expertise, um, you know, although there are people who sort of, you know, start college as, you know, kind of an English lit degree and such and decide, you know, later in life that they want to go back to school for engineering and such. Um, and then there's also engineers that decide they want to be pilots. I mean, I work with quite a few engineers that actually are kind of, you know, as a hobby more so and not as a career, but are pilots on the side. Um, 
one engineer that I work with, he actually uh, has built his own helicopter out of a kit and such, and um, you know flies all the time out of Compton Airport uh, over near where I live. And so, um, so I would say it doesn't always matter what you choose in heading to a path, as long as you try to kind of excel at that thing, right? So if you're gonna major in psychology, then you make sure and knock it out, get good grades. If you're going to you know, go straight to the military out of high school, just try and excel and be the best. Um, because when you have that, it's hard to sort of deny if you have a capability because people can not like you for whatever reason, but they can never deny what your capabilities are. And as long as you're able to sort of prove those capabilities, then you'll, you, you're one step ahead as far as getting a seat at the table. Lieutenant Commander Holmes, I saw you nodding very much in agreement. That resonate with you? No, absolutely. Uh, especially the part where um, Mr. Call talked about nobody being able to deny that. Once you've got that piece of paper and you've got that, you know, that expertise uh, kind of backed by your university, nobody can deny that because, uh, again, I mean, even um, I'm sure I'm, it's no different just for the Coast Guard, but you may find yourself. Um, in situations where people just don't like you. And just based off of that, maybe uh, they can make it a little bit more difficult to get to that next step. But when you've got a background more similar to Mr. Carl's, it, it makes it a lot tougher. And I'm just curious, sir, um, the, the pilot out of Compton Airport, is that Robin Petgrave you're talking about? Probably. No, it's, no, it's not actually, but I've met him before because of okay. um, the events. Yeah. I know Robin really well. <laughs> we can talk about that offline. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's Rob, Robin and I go way back. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. yeah. Right. I actually helped him form the Tomorrow's Aeronautical Museum that I understand you're now a board member of. I, well, I haven't lately now that with this new job, but yeah, I've, I've, I think I met him around 2010 or so. And he's just been a wonderful, wonderful person. And we've done a lot of events out there at the Compton Airport. We used to fly the, the 65 down there to the airport and we'd have a bunch of Tuskegee events. And right. uh, yeah, he does a lot time. of things for for the young people. Um, he's, and he's been that way for a long time. Um, yep. Not to digress too, any further into that, because you and I could probably share a lot of stories with that. Dio, you, were, you had a question for our, our professional guest. Yes. Um... I have a question about having, um, what is life like having more than just one career path or one passion? Uh, could you speak a little bit more about that? I've always asked myself, um, cause I'm an author, I enjoy writing books, but I also wanna have uh, some sort of uh, career, anything in aviation, well, mainly an airline pilot, uh, but, I also want to write and I don't want that to go away because this is a gift is something I, I think I was born with. Uh, so yeah, would you uh, talk a little bit more about that? Anybody want to chime yeah, I'll in take, on that? Uh, I'll take a stab at that one. Um, definitely it's, um, it if you have various hobbies or various things you're good at or, or affinities towards different things, it helps to make you kind of a well-rounded individual, right? I mean, we, we work with a lot of people in our jobs, in our careers, um, but rarely, at least for me, rarely do I bond with a coworker or such based on what we do when we're at work, right? I mean, we're all there, we're all building spacecraft and this and that. And so there's kind of nothing special about that from the standpoint of who you build as your network. But the fact that one coworker may be interested in photography, maybe one's a, a writer on the side. I mean, those are the things that kind of really back up who we are as people, because what we do from nine to five or, you know, whatever your work hours don't completely define who we are. It's sort of, you know, because you only spend about, you know, a third of your day at work, right? So kind of who you are when the lights at work kind of shut down you know, really help define you and make you better at what you do during um, business hours and such. So, you know, if you love to write, write. I mean, there may be aspect of you writing for a magazine in aerospace one day or, or you know, working kind of, you know, the multimedia side of it, as well as being a pilot. Um, these are all sort of skills that you, I think you have in your toolbox um, and you got to keep all those tools sharp. So, um, so I definitely encourage you to try and be a jack of as many trades as you can because you never know which one will be the one that will kind of elevate you to your dream. 
Yeah, Lieutenant Commander Holmes, do you want to chime in on that too? In this in this regard, I mean, you have flown helicopters for for quite a while, and now you're actually sitting in an office uh, as a liaison to the Senate um, for the Coast Guard. Uh, that that's a bit of a transition. Uh, what's your perspective on that? Um, so for for us in the military, it's a little bit different. Um, so for example, if my passion were to hey, I want to um, go back and be a ship driver now at this point in my career, or maybe I want to fly fixed wing. That's not as easy as a transition as it was in the beginning. Once the military has invested the training and the money into you year after mm. year, they kind of want you to, to stay with that one um, thing to, to be an expert in your craft so that you can come back and be leadership. So one day I can maybe go back and be the executive officer, the commanding officer of my, of my own air station. But one thing that the military, uh, specifically the Coast Guard has allowed me to do, things like being a White House fellow, they let me take a break from flying for a year. I was a White House fellow. I got to work at NASA for a year, very cool. Now I'm in a staff tour that's, con you know, after about three operational tours, uh, you go into a staff tour where you learn how to lead, you learn to see kind of what happens behind the curtains, how the sausage is made. So I'm lucky enough to be working in congressional affairs right now as a deputy Senate liaison, working with all the senators and their staff and, and trying to, to move the commandant, the, the leader of the Coast Guard, all of his priorities, trying to move those forward, trying to make sure we get an authorization appropriations every year, we get the funding we need. And all those things. So it's just, it, it's a two-year tour, really, really neat uh, opportunity for me. And I'm looking forward to taking everything that I'm learning from this job back, back to, um, to aviation and back to the service when I'm done. So I think one of the common denominators is that a lot of the, the aspiring young aviation professionals, they don't really always realize that while you, you have this goal, um, you may do another path or another turn uh, either after that goal or before that goal. So, I mean, and, and all of you have kind of alluded to that in one way or another. Um, and the positions that you're in now, I'm sure when you were flying uh, for the Coast Guard down in Miami, uh, I, I would be surprised if you said, oh yeah, one day I, I was gonna be sitting in the, you know, DC uh, as a liaison. Am I right about that? You're absolutely correct. Yeah. I, I wouldn't have thought it at all. Yeah, yeah. So, but I, I do. I want to just echo again what Mr. Carl mentioned about just rounding yourself out. You never know. Like, right. I could, God forbid, something could happen to my vision, or I something could happen, and maybe I I can't fly. And so, when you when you have this other hobby and craft that you're continuing to perfect over time, I mean, it's a perfect segue to that next step um, in in life. You know, I'll maybe retired here in the in ne less than five years, and you know, if I were a writer all these all this time that I was in the Coast Guard, maybe I could easily pick that up as a as a second profession. So I think you should continue to write and and become the best writer that you can because, uh, like Carl said, you never know how it'll pay pay you back in the end. Yeah, that's a really good point. And, and so in talking with um, and answering Dio's question about that, Dio, the, there's a lot of uh, opportunity out there in terms of mixing your profession, so to speak. It just depends on the individual, how much drive you have, and then where those opportunities lie as you move forward with the things that you want to do. I happen to know from reading your background that you have some entrepreneurial spirit in you. Um, you know, you talk about writing. You've already authored two books, which, you know, I don't know how many of the rest of us can say we've got a couple of books, uh, you know, at Barnes and Noble or whatever. <laughs> but, but congratulations on that, by the way. Um, for, for, for doing that at such a young age, you're just getting started. But did, did we answer your question about that in terms of what you're uh, wanting to do as you pursue flying along with these other talents and interests that you have? Yes, yes okay. you did. Okay. Nick, well, you've been sitting there patiently. Did you have another question for our guests? Oh, uh, well, actually another question just popped up in my head as, um, as what Ms. Holmes was saying. I mean, for you guys, like she said, we you know what the future could hold for you, you know, after your profession, what do you guys, you know, after your <laughs> profession, what do you guys plan on, you know, doing as, a, as far as, you know, after your current so, career? What's career? next? Yeah. That's a great question. 
let's see, I have a half a million hobbies. And so um, that's all. You know, once, yeah. So <laughs> once I don't have to go to work um, every day, I will get to spend more time sailing, you know, more time with my photography stuff, more time model railroading, uh, you know, racing cars. I mean, all that kinds of things. Um, there's, there's plenty of stuff out there that I would be doing if I didn't have to, you know, pay a mortgage and things like that. So, um, do you re do you think you've reached the pinnacle of your career? In other words, at at twenty five years now, um, I think I have. I um, I uh, kind of the next step would be to you know become a director and then VP type thing after that. Um, and but I'm at the point I think where I don't want to give up that much of my work life balance any longer. Um, you know, especially with, you know, COVID and such and, you know, amount of, you know, fellow Americans we've lost. Um, I mean, none of us know when, you know, life is going to expire on us, right? Or, or the, our loved ones. And I find that at the end of the day, um, it's not that, you know, PowerPoint presentation or that, um, that I worked on or that budget that I worked on at work um, that really have, you know, those things are, are, are interesting and, and, and they're fun in some cases um, and they're necessary. But a lot of times, you know, those aren't the things that when I think of, you know, the sum of my life um, that I, you know, wish I had done more of, right? I mean, it's the, you know, spending time with the family, going on vacations, you know, kind of doing those hobbies that you like. Um, those are the things that I really think bring me you know, joy in my life. Um, and so uh, definitely, you know, those are the things I want to, you know, spend more time doing after. I'm yeah. On the other hand, Lieutenant Commander Holmes, at the beginning of the program, you said you were just warming up. <laughs> I think you said that. <laughs> yeah, Vince said that. <laughs> um, okay, I said it for you. <laughs> well, yeah, you know, there's so much out there. And um, like I said, I, I joined the Coast Guard when I was in college, end of my sophomore year. And so there's just a lot going on. And um, I've thought about learning how to sail. I've thought about just moving to Belize and opening my own tiki hut and selling like conch and cocktails and stuff like that. Um, I really enjoy doing things like this and, and outreach and talking to uh, young people just about life and overcoming adversities and, and things like that. I would also, I'd like to write a book just like Dio. Uh, I really like <laughs> spin and cycle and so I, I've even thought about being a spin instructor, you know? So, you know, I don't know, um, but the work-life balance would be something that's very important to me. I mean, flying, just like all, all the guests here, a lot of the work that we've done, you know, over time it can be, it can wear on you and it can be taxing and, and stressful at, at points. And so I think I'd be looking for something a little bit more relaxed, I guess. Steve, how about you? You've had a full military career. You've been flying in the civilian world. What are your thoughts about this? Uh, yes, sir. As far as flying is concerned, what I'll probably do now, instead of chasing you young guys uh, up the ladder, is go out and uh, train as a CFI at one of the local schools. Uh, at this point, I don't want to be on a schedule. <laughs> <laughs> uh, more laid back. I don't want to be tied to a schedule and, and climbing a ladder again so much. So uh, you'll probably see me next is that salty guy at a flight school, uh, old guy who appears not to have too much motivation, which is not necessarily true. It's just uh, kind of been there and done that. So, uh, <laughs> I need something a little bit more low key. Uh, <laughs> kind of work my own schedule a little no, bit. No, that, that's actually really great because training – uh, teaching new pilots is something that's very much needed. And that's actually going to grow because while we're in a little bit of a setback because of COVID-19, um, the industry is in a desperate need for pilots. You guys, Nico and, and Dio, you guys have a huge future and opportunity with it because uh, as soon as we get past this uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic, uh, it'll go back to where it was just prior which was a desperate need for pilots, mechanics, avionics techs, just about everybody in the industry. And then the space industry is exploding. Um, bad term, but it's growing <laughs> dramatically. <laughs> so, um, but you know, Nico and, and Dio, you guys, uh, so Dio, you're a sophomore at Arizona State University and Nico, you're a junior in high school. 
Uh, so you guys have a bright future ahead of you, but you have, you did hit a roadblock this year uh, with the COVID-19. Uh, what, what's your guys' perspective on it uh, in terms of how it's affected you and, and how you're looking at it at this point? Either one of you. Uh, like COVID really affected me a lot um, from like, from when things got really serious. I remember uh, my last ever flight was uh, my pre-solo flight back in March. Uh, I had wow. my solo flight scheduled for uh, two days, uh, two days later. And then I found out I had to leave for spring. Uh, we had a uh, trip to uh, California for spring break. Uh, I told my instructor, you know what, instead of, you know, flying right now and rushing, let me just fly back. Let me just fly when I come back in a week. Uh, I had a, I was to fly home for two days uh, during the spring break. I, I came home and my mom was like, you know what, Dio? I think you should cancel your flight back. Uh, it was a two day trip that turned into a five month trip because uh, uh, school suddenly turned everything online. Uh, this was after spring break, uh, late March. They were like, uh, no, you know, all the classes are gonna be uh, on Zoom and we, will, we, will, we may or may not come back for the uh, fall 20 semester. In my head, I'm like, am I even gonna fly? Will I even solo? Because if I were to take long, I would need remedial flights. You know how ATP is very uh, strict. And so I didn't know where, how things would end. Uh, I was like, can I just fly back? I was like, no, we're in quarantine. You can't fly. I was like, okay. And so I stayed here throughout uh, the second part of uh, the spring semester, throughout the summer. And then went back uh, in August. And then uh, my flight school had some things going on and uh, they were closing and opening. And so I was like, maybe I should fly in the uh, spring semester again. So now... I'm going back to flying. I haven't soloed yet uh, due to what happened, uh, COVID. And so- Now you got to play a little semester. bit of catch up, right? Yes, yeah, those remedial flights because uh, they cost a lot of money. That's why I didn't want to do them. Uh, so that and classes, as far as classes, pretty much all my classes were uh, remote. Uh, we had an option to go uh, in person for some of them but it was just better to do a remote because you never know who you're going to run into. Not everyone, uh, not every one of the students at ASU, especially the campus I go to stays on campus. It's a relatively small campus within a big school. It's polytechnic. Uh, so I chose to do everything remote and uh, the experience is kind of different from being in person. Well, it should, it's very different because, and, you, and the grades reflected that too. Uh, they weren't as, you know, as good as the first uh, two semesters in college. So yeah, it really did affect in many kinds of ways. Yeah. But so on the other are... hand, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, on the other hand, I've, I've been able to do a lot uh, throughout quarantine, being, being home uh, for most of it, uh, being inside, indoors. Uh, I mean, I've been able to read a lot, write a lot, uh, explore other uh, skills. I actually just got into trading stocks this year and I was uh, being in quarantine. Uh, I got the opportunity to read a lot. So um, I'm expanding my spectrum of, you know, uh, what I will be able to do in the future, things that I want to try. So, I mean, bad things came with COVID and other good things. Yeah. Yeah. It sounds like a mix of things. You have any stock tips? Just kidding. <laughs> um, but uh, um so you guys have uh both you and um what was i gonna say to you uh oh i know i wanted to mention this to, in terms of you Dio. so Dio, you got involved with the aero club foundation of washington uh here in washington dc uh which has been you've actually gotten two scholarships from from them can you tell us real quick yes. how you got involved uh, and and uh, and then what the process was like to get that kind of support from them. Uh, as far as in, uh, involving with them, uh, this was part of uh, trans STEM at uh, Cardozo. I believe okay. Cardozo is the only school with trans STEM Academy, uh, and they're connected with Aero Club. We would have luncheons about two twice a year, something like that. And uh, being part of trans STEM, we had an opportunity to. Um, do to 
participate in these uh, aero club luncheons where they would have uh, people from military uh, talk to students, uh, aspiring students, those who want to go to the military or just career in general, right. uh, advice about life and a lot of different things. And um, I got to meet uh, the president, who uh, Miss Rose, who connected me with you uh, a few days ago. So she was... Um, she was connected with uh, Transstem director. And when I got to apply for the scholarship in 2019, earlier last year, before I graduated, so she knew about me, she knew my story. And I mean, not to say that that increased my uh, success or probability of winning the scholarship, but she was aware of who I was and uh, she was happy when I got the scholarship uh, the first time. And I didn't know I would be able to get it the second time. Uh, but I mean, even people who were, I was, I was competing against were also part of the luncheon. So I wasn't really the only one. And sure. the second time, second time I, I applied, uh, I, I didn't know I would get the scholarship. I actually almost forgot about it. I got an email, like, uh, three months later after applying, they're like, oh, you got the scholarship. It's like, wow, it, it's impressive. But, uh, the things I needed to get the scholarships were, uh, two recommendation letters, one, uh, when I was in high school back in 12th grade, uh, I believe one came from uh, my advi advisor or counselor and then one from a teacher. Um, I was lucky enough to have a letter from the principal. So I used that uh, in a few of the scholarships I applied for. And most the, the ones I used the principal uh, letter uh, recommendation, I got pretty much uh, most of them. I would recommend it for Nico when he's... Uh, applying for scholarships exactly uh, i was just getting ready to say that i wanted to i was glad you shared your story because i think it's real important uh for you guys and, and everybody watching to know that there are a lot of scholarships out there and some of them are really good scholarships for both flight training yeah. and for academics and that type of thing and they come from different programs associations etc and the more you're involved in in knowing about that in other words involved as a student member of an aviation association like Aircraft Owner and Pilots Association, National Business Aviation Association, you know, et cetera, uh, and, and things like that, uh, EAA, Experimental Aircraft Association, um, and then the, the local ones like the Aero Club uh, Foundation of Washington, the more you are involved in that, uh, the more you'll find out about these opportunities that exist. And as a matter of fact, AOPA is giving flight training scholarships out uh, for 2021, and they just announced it recently and I had shared that with Nico, um, you might even qualify for that for the flight training portion of your stuff, um, Dio. So you may want to want to look into that. We can we can I can touch base with you about that offline if you're not familiar with AOPA. So I wanted to mention that. Nico, I wanted to give you a chance if you had uh, we we're ru running out of time, but before we start to wrap things up, did you have any other questions for our guests? Um Really, you guys really touched on the things that I'd like to know and understand. So I'd say it's sufficient, sufficient enough. Yeah. <laughs> okay, good. That's great to hear. How about you, Dio? I'll give you one more chance if you had any other questions. I don't think I have a question. Okay. So um, it, this is great. Uh, it gives us a few minutes because I wanted to let each of our professional guests give, uh, you know, a, a word of advice um, about what they recommend for you guys moving forward. Uh, and also you guys, we have enough time. If you have, if you want to share briefly uh, an influence on your life that made a difference. Um, you kind of started off that with uh, Lieutenant Commander uh, Holmes uh, about meeting that, connecting with, and then uh, meeting the African-American female pilot who that seemed to kind of influence uh, the track that you started to take in your career. So I'll start with you and, and then we'll, we'll move through everybody else. Um, yeah, she was it. Her, she's a commander now, Commander Janine Menzi. We're still good friends. She's been a mentor to me throughout my career. Um, so that's the first piece of advice I would offer up is to have um, people like that in your circle, to have the mentors, have the people uh, close by that you can call when things get challenging, because there will be challenges, because that's just how life is. And so uh, I remember specifically being at my first unit, and I was I had some challenges going on there and I remember, and it got pretty bad. And uh, it was a Friday afternoon and I left work. I called Janine. 
She didn't pick up. I left a message and I said, Janine, I just want you to be the first to know that I'm walking away from aviation on Monday. I'm turning in my wings because I've had enough and I could, you know, be working somewhere else and making the same amount of money. And she called me back on Sunday and she said, look, I'm not trying to convince you one way or the other, but if you're not absolutely 100% sure about it, just don't do anything. And so Monday morning I get to work and I'm, I'm in my dress uniform, not my flight suit, because I'm thinking I'm really going to go, you know, walk over to the captain's office and tell him, you know, I quit or you can have these wings back. And then, you know, and then I just remembered, I said, LaShonda, you went to the same flight school as everybody else. You earn these wings the same way that everybody else did. Uh, so just stick with it. And so th those are the two pieces. If you're not 100% sure about a decision, maybe just take a moment to think about it or to lean, lean on someone else and, and definitely keep those mentors close by. Great, thank you. Steve, have a minute or so. <clears throat> Uh, no matter what career path you choose, there are going to be challenges. And uh, often when you get to where you want to be, you'll find that uh, pushback times and, and a lot of other things take some of the, you know, some of the bright lights out of what you wanted to do. But what else would you be doing if, you know, in my, in my case, I love flying. I really do. Uh, I would say self-described attention deficit disorder, but <laughs> I'm flying. Uh, you know, I mean, really, my brain is, I could be fat, dumb, and happy, and uh, my brain is still working, <laughs> unlike some other times. So so it's actually a good job for me, but uh, there are always going to be challenges no matter what you want to do. And even when you get to where you want to go, if you want to be a fireman, a police officer, I didn't explore a program, you know, lights and sirens are fun, but most of the police work is not lights and sirens and chasing bad guys, you know. So, uh, but in my case, what else would I want to do? Not much. Not much. Um, so just continue to move forward if that's what you want to do, and, and understand, you know, you're gonna you're gonna win some, you're gonna lose some, but um, you know, keep your eye on the prize, and uh, you'll get to where you want to go, uh, Lord Lord's willing. <laughs> Great, thank you, Carl. Take us home. Well, see, for me, growing up, you know, like I've mentioned before, my uncle that was an electrical engineer, you know, motivated me for that field, but also my dad was key because one thing he always told us that. You know, he doesn't care what we end up doing in life as long as we try to be our best at it. Um, and, you know, you may not end up being the best, but the fact that you're trying to be the best is going to um, elevate you. So I definitely say to um, both um, Nico and uh, Dio to just try to be the best at what you do. Um, and, you know, like uh, the lieutenant uh, the colonel said, you know, definitely, um, you know, go out there and make your networks with folks. Um, you definitely have to... Um, also learn from your mistakes. Um, you know, Steve talked about, you know, kind of facing adversity and difficulties and things are gonna be hard. Um, I never learned in my life a good lesson from anything that was easy. It's the things that were hard that taught me pretty much 99% of what I know. And it's those things that sort of toughen your skin and make you go through, make you capable of going through even more difficult things because sometimes life gets easy, but sometimes it gets more difficult. Um, and if you never have to face adversity, when it comes, it's going to hit you hard. So, it's, so if you can basically get through those little hurdles along the way, it's just going to make you tougher for when you hit that big wall, you're going to be able to jump over it while everybody else is going to be, you know, crashing into it. So, um, and then lastly, I just want to say, um, it's been a pleasure meeting, you know, both you two guys, Nico and um, Dio. I mean, you guys are really kind of the future, and I think it's in good hands um, after meeting you guys. And um, you know, definitely take off and 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 keep uh, fulfilling the legacy. Thank you very much, Carl. Thank you for those great words, and and thank all of you for your feedback and your your interaction and, and comments about everything, or your input. Uh, really appreciate everybody being on the program today. Uh, we're in the holiday season. We're we're in the middle of the COVID-19 and everybody's also just busy with life and work and, and that type of thing. So I appreciate, you know, Lieutenant Commander Holmes squeezing us in, in between your meetings uh, and you two, uh, Carl, doing the same thing because I know you're getting ready to roll to a meeting any second now. Um, but as Carl said, very happy to have you, Nico and, and, and Deal. Deal, thank you so much for letting us use your nickname. Um, <laughs> uh, for being on the, uh, the program and, and having this opportunity to, to talk directly with some 
some outstanding professionals that we have in the industry um, who've, who've had major accomplishments and that type of thing. Everybody have a great holiday. Um, and again, thanks for being on All Things Aviation. I'm Vince Mickens. You guys take care. Take care. Take care. Thanks, and Merry Christmas there. to everyone. Christmas. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.